Hey everybody, welcome. I'm Doug Kaufman with Tomorrow's Technician. Welcome to today's live stream with Summit Racing Equipment. With me today is Justin from Summit Racing. Justin, welcome. Thanks for, thanks for having me. You know, we've done a ton of stuff with you guys. It's always a pleasure to come over here and, you know, just talk about car stuff. Like, exactly. This is, this is what I eat up. This is what puts a smile on my face every day. Hey, we're going to have a lot of fun today. It's actually kind of like a physical education class today because we're working on building that bottom end. So I imagine we're going to be doing, what, some, like, squats and some lunges and things like that. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, you know, we got to get them glutes looking good. That's right. Um, but, yeah, no, we're going to be doing a lot of fun stuff, uh, talking about what it takes to build that, you know, performance-oriented bottom end for, you know, we're, we're going to be a little LS-focused today, but we're this kind of applies to everything. You know, this is a very broad subject, and, you know, when you're putting a, a motor together, it all starts at the bottom. So, you know, when you're building a sandwich, you don't throw the bologna down first. You got to start with the bread and go from there. Right, so, right. And that's what this is all about. You know, we have a bottom end over here. We have a bunch of cool parts from Summit Racing to show you guys and talk about, and we're going to get right into it, you know. That's right. Let's talk about, let's start with those, um, the parts you put on the sandwich, the parts. Let's start at the bottom of the bottom end and work our way up. And now the engine we have over here is, of course, flipped upside down. So, kids, don't put your motor in your car like this. Yeah, no, this, if you put this in the car like this, you will have a bad time. So, But this thing is absolutely, you know, we have a sweet-looking LS over here. Um, this is fun. And, you know, LS is kind of the culmination of a lot of things. There's, this was, you know, this is not your granddaddy's two bolt small block. You know, mm -hmm. this is not a 283. These things are fantastic. And this, we have actually a six liter sitting over here, which is a, you know, the LS thing kind of iron block world comes in three common sizes. You know, you have four eights, five threes, and six liters. And then the aluminum stuff is just, there's six twos and all sorts of other fun stuff. And then with LS, you have a bunch of aftermarket stuff too right. that goes into all sorts of crazy, you know, LSXs. And there's a lot, there's a lot. The whole LS engine family is absolutely wild. But the big thing is when you're starting and you're going to build an engine, you got to start with the big piece first. And, you know, it's not a Lego, it's a building block. Right. And so you got to start with your block. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to go either buy yourself a new block, but a lot of guys are doing the junkyard finds. So just like our forefathers, you were going to the junkyard, ripping one of these out of your local, you know, yard, pick and pull, whatever you want to call it. And you were going to start there. And yeah, uh, it's became really popular over the last couple of years to, you know, the SBE records and all that, stock bottom end, throw a cam, some heads in it, throw it in the car, put a giant un uh, unbranded turbo on it and throw a bunch of boost at it and see what happens. And the Gen 4 LS stuff, is it's got better with the generation. So you guys, you have a lot of guys getting Gen 4 bottom ends. You take it apart, you gapple the rings, you throw it back together and it makes a thousand horsepower. But it's how many times will it make a thousand horsepower <laughs> right. is the key. And we want to see you guys make some big power but also be reliable because it gets um gets a little old ripping one of these out every other weekend yeah. and going to the racetrack. Yeah. But yeah, so the big thing is starting with a good block. How and do you find that good block? What's the, what are the steps to look for when you're off in the in the the, the parts uh, the back of a parts lot or something like that? What are you looking for? So a lot of times the first thing I'm going to do is, you know, a lot of, they're still in vehicles. So you are going to have to get a little crazy and either rip it out of the vehicle. But a lot of times some of them are already out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're going to want to flip it over, pop the oil pan off it, make sure there's no pieces in the bottom. That's your key. But there's other factors you can do, like see if the thing's been weathered, see if it's rusty, nasty. Usually you'll pull one of these apart and they came out of daily drivers, so they didn't get warmed up, or there'll be a lot of gunk, right. and so you're just looking for good overall health. But if you're just looking for a block, like kind of the world, you're gonna go to the machine shop when it comes to building a performance engine. Right. So you're just gonna be able to kind of just look at the overall health, make sure there's nothing crazy, like so maybe pop the heads off it, see what the top end looks like, and um, go from there. So once you've scored a good block, you get it home, bust the whole thing apart, hit it with some oven cleaner, clean it up, um, then it's time to go to the machine shop, and the machine shop is one of the very particular places that you're going to want to be. It's, um, you know, you want to find a good, local, trustworthy machine shop that, you know, has some history, and then you're going to want to kind of come up with a realistic plan on what kind of engine you want to build. We all want to build, you know, we all aspire to, to, to build pro stock quality stuff, but not all of us are on a pro stock budget. Mm -hmm. So... It's good to be in mindful of, you want to build to what you can afford. 
because if you break it, you want to be able to fix it. You know, right. you can buy a bunch of expensive parts and do this, and the thing breaks, and then you're eating soup trying to afford <laughs> new parts. So, which we've all been there. I've uh, I've been there too, and um, you know, I rather buy race car parts and eat Raymond. That's just me as a person. So once you get to the machine shop, you're going to want to have this thing gone through. Either you're going to kind of need to jump around a little bit, figure out what pistons you want to use, what crank, what stroke, what you're going to build. So are you using... Now, the thing is about the LS platform, as I said, the generations go on, this stuff gets better and better. So a lot of guys still run stock cranks mm -hmm. and Gen 4 rods and just throw a aftermarket piston, like our Summit Pro LS pistons. And we actually have a piston with the pin size that's specific for running a, a Gen 4 setup. So, but then also, if you're trying to get a little crazier, we have some Summit Pro LS rods and cranks too to go mild to wild. Right. Let's talk about, let's uh, get a little more specific about some of the components. Some of our listeners might not know all the details of, of what goes into a crank. Walk us through, you know, there it is, fully, uh, fully set up in the engine. Here it is. Talk about the, the different components that are on the crank. So, you know, we have... And where and how the, the various components mount up to it. Yeah, so this is kind of, this is the, the, the bone of the engine. This is kind of, everything connects to this. This is, this sits in the block and this is what transfer, essentially this is what's transferring your power from a linear motion to a rotational motion to go through your transmission and your rear end. So looking here, you have these right here, which are your main journals. Mm -hmm. And so this is where it sits on... You have your block, then you have a bearing that goes in there, and essentially when the thing's making oil pressure, you have a thin, the bearings in the crank, ideally in a perfect world, do not touch. Right. So they ride on a thin coat of pressurized oil. So they're spinning on that, and then your rods connect to the rod journals here, and each journal shares two rods. So from there, you know, that's, like I said, basically you're transporting linear motion, to a rotational motion. Let's so, stop for a second, talk about the bearings, because these are just simple little pieces of metal. There's nothing high tech about them, right? Oh, to, quite to the contrary, <laughs> Doug. Um, you know, some of, there's tons of cool bearings out there, you know, tons of different manufacturers from people like Mail. And one of the things I like to use, I'm a big, I'm partial to King Racing bearings. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things when you're building a high performance bottom end, you'll notice that you might have to, when you're going through and measuring this, you might have to buy multiple sets of bearings to get the desired clearances that mm -hmm. you want. And we're gonna get into that and talk about getting crank clearance and right. all that because that's the one thing you don't want is, um, you know, my grandfather always said, if you build a loose engine, only one person will know, um, and that's you. Mm -hmm. You build a tight engine, everybody and your everybody's gonna know because it's gonna make some heinous noises. Yes. <laughs> created uh, creating some uh, ex explosions and other uh, pieces coming loose. Yeah, no, that's the last, you know, <laughs> I I like to find glitter in the bottom end sometimes when I'm looking for gold, but not in this bottom yeah, end. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So back to our crankshaft here. You know, we talked about our rod journals and our main journals on an a LS crank and some of this modern fuel injected stuff. What we have here is our reluctor wheel, and this is where your crank sensor reads off of, and it's going to kind of let it lets the computer know in what rotation and what's going on, where what is. Mm -hmm. So. Because unlike, you know, with your old carbureted stuff and that, and spark, you know, you just need fuel, air, spark, and it'll go. With a crank sensor, it lets you know, like I said, the location of what's spinning where, how fast it's spinning, and crank, good, clean crank signal is important. And a lot of times you'll see, like, these are really well attached um, in high horsepower applications. These actually can come loose sometimes on uh, factory cranks and cause all sorts of crazy issues. In LS, they come in two specific sizes. So you have... 24X, which is the early style, and then 58X, which is the later style. Which is the number of teeth. Yes, that's how many times, how many teeth it reads and yeah. goes past the sensor. And yeah. essentially, the more you have, the faster and better signal. The you're more precise get. you're getting, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's all. This thing is a big. This is a big watch, mm -hmm. and everything needs to be in time in particular, or else things hit each other and try to occupy uh, occupy the same space at the same time, and. Um, you know, with uh, how physics work and all that, that's not possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And these things, remember, these things are spinning. If you're turning 5,000 RPM, that's that, 5,000 times per minute. And 5,000 is just where the party starts. Exactly. Friend. That's, that's just that's, idle. That's really conservative. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Think about how many times a second these components are going up and down inside that block. Yeah. 
Amazing. Well, it, it's crazy to kind of think what it all is going on in there. Like I said, you're it's there's explosions and mm -hmm. rotating stuff mm -hmm. and very very violent. I would I would love to be able to see like a combustion chamber and what's going on because I it just has to look absolutely fantastic. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, these the, the the bearings fit within the within the uh, around the journals within the block and they're not perfectly round. A lot of people might think that these bearings are perfectly round when you put them in. They just fit right in. Yeah, they kind of, so you'll kind of look at our LS style bearings here and these ones have a retainment tab because you have to have something to hold them or else this is just going to spin mm -hmm. and spinning bearings is a bad time. There's a, they're actually really, it, they kind of click in um, and you have a lot of guys, there's a big debate whether you oil put assembly lube on the back of the bearing or if you put them in dry. Um, you have to think, and when it's inside an engine, this is all pressured. Oil's going to get behind here, so mm -hmm. I personally like to put assembly lube on everything, mm -hmm. and just like, and there, and that's you know, you can never have enough assembly lube. There yeah. is, you don't metal on metal parts is not ideal, especially oh, no. during your first startup and all that, you know. And that's the thing is when you're doing one of these, like a fresh bottom end, uh, we have really good options for what we call a pre oiler. Now, if you're building a small block, you can pop your distributor out, put a drive in it, put pressure to the bottom end. Not so much on the LS because we don't have a distributor. Mm -hmm. So they have these cool tanks that you put air pressure in and connect it to a main and open it. And yeah, it'll shove oil, pressurized oil through the whole thing. So you're guaranteed a good quality startup. Well, at least on the oil pressure side. So the other crazy part about the LS versus like your small box Chevy or a lot of other deals is your oil pump is one to one with the crankshaft. It actually runs off the front of this thing. So that is spinning. If this is spinning 5,000 RPMs, the oil pump is spinning 5,000 RPMs. And the way they work is basically you have two kind of, I'm going to be honest, I always pronounce it wrong, but it's, it's a vein pump. It's uh -huh. a Schroeder, whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it. And it's sitting there and moving on an oblong motion and making oil pressure that way. The LS deal oils almost too good. And it gets to a point in very high RPM applications where the thing actually starts to cavitate and whip air. There's companies like Melling that make really fantastic high-performance oil pumps that mm -hmm. allow you to get just some more RPMs, and they work even better. And then if you're building real rowdy race car shit, we're dry sumping it, and that's that's a whole <laughs> nother shebang. <laughs> that's right. We don't have the uh, we don't have that on this setup here, um, but you know that plays in with, uh, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about the the, the pan and how those things all come together. Later. Yeah, because that's that's just as important, you know, yeah. a performance, a good baffled performance oil pan, you know, it, it really depends if you're drag race, there, there's different different strokes for different folks, you know, if you're drag racing, you're going to use a different pan than a guy that's an auto crossing, um, and it also depends, you know, L the, the new hashtag is LS swap the world, so guys are shoving these things in everything, yeah. you see them. I've seen some LSs and just some white, like, you, it makes you scratch your head sometimes, like, oh, I can't believe you did this yeah, swap, yeah. this is fantastic. So there's tons of oil pans out there for swaps, like, you know, it's yeah, it makes it, seem, it makes it seem like it's the perfect uh, solution for every application, but there's variations that you have to take into account for each of those. Yes, yes. So, like I said, you, you just have to be, when you're putting together what you're swapping this thing, that, that that's important. And actually, Summit Racing has a really great LS swap guide if you're trying to shove one of these motors in. Whatever. It yeah. doesn't matter. Like I said, we, there's a lot of people that have figured it out, and we like to help you guys out and uh, not do so much of the guesswork. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of parts that will help you bolt this up to whatever you've got. Yes, yes. <laughs> Coming out the back end. All right, so from the crank, let's talk, uh, let's talk next. Let's talk uh, uh, connecting rods. So, yeah, like, like I said earlier, there's a, the stock LS components. There's a lot of fantastic stuff out there. But Summit Racing actually has came out with our own Summit Pro LS line of piston or rods. My bad. These connect to the pistons, guys. Um, but there's all sorts of different variations of this rod, different lengths, different pin size. Um, we make something for basically every LS application. And even not just LS, you know, sure. small block Chevy, small block Ford, um, all – all your peas and carrots. Like mm -hmm. we got, we got a rod for basically everything. But these are there's a couple different rod designs, and what we have here in front of us is an H beam. H beams are really strong. You also have I beam rods. There's combination rods from like companies like Boost Line. They make a really crazy looking rod. Mm -hmm. And then to go even farther than that, you have steel and aluminum rod options. Like 
And, then, and like I said, if you're building an aluminum rod motor, it's going to spin a whole bunch of RPMs. And uh, that's race car stuff. That's real right. rowdy. That's that's not daily driver. But right. we're, we're talking about building a hot street motor here, guys. So, but yeah, with rods, this is important. This is what's taking, like I said, the brunt of that explosion from your combustion and forcing the crank around. So these need to be good and strong. Now, one of the things to talk about with rods as well is, and also even crank kind of when we get into talking about our main caps and all that, is bolt selection. Mm -hmm. You know, with the factory GM stuff, a lot of it is torque to yield. So it's use it once, throw it away. One of the things you can do is upgrade your stuff to some ARP bolts and studs. A lot of guys do it. It's a really popular option. Now, one thing, if you're taking bolts out and putting, you know, taking weak bolts out and putting studs in or an aftermarket stud, you're going to need to be mindful and maybe get your re rod resized. And that's something they can do at your local machine shop. Um, we would all love to be able to do it inside our own garage, but it's expensive tools to require right. that. Same with, uh, you know, balancing crankshafts, doing all that, grinding a crankshaft. Um, that's all... Leave it to the machine shop, guys. Or if you have a full machine shop at home, get on to it because I am extremely jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so from the so we got the rod, we get the pistons, and the ever important. Oh yeah, you got to have piston, pist pin piston or... pins are important. If this is not inside, um, things aren't doing what they're <laughs> supposed to. It's just going to shove it to the bottom. So, but yeah, this is what attaches your piston to your connecting rod. So also same deal bunch of different sizes, um, different lock styles too. You know, we all have launched a spiral, you know, a yeah, piston right. clip or a spiral lock across the room. There's a point where you should just sit down and get good at putting spiral locks in, like get a bag, get a piston, um, you know, sit down and just practice because you want to talk about arguing with yourself at, you know, wee hours and then you launch, you know, you're, you're on number 15 and you launch number 16 across the room and then you're digging around your garage all yeah. night trying to yeah. find that one. Then you end up driving back to Summit in the morning to get another <laughs> one because you don't find it and you find it three weeks later. <laughs> so uh, how do those, show how those connect there? Yeah, so it's it's a real, it's not anything crazy. So we're going to take our rod here. And also something to think about is these, your pistons do have, this stuff all needs to be orientated properly. So kind of on our rods and pistons here, there's a flat side and a beveled side, and your beveled side always goes out towards out towards the end of the journal. And then your two flat sides are going to go next to your corresponding rod. So Because these are two two rods on the same journal. Yeah, every journal on at least a V8 shares, shares mm -hmm. a journal. So that's important that both flat sides are against each other and not the bevels or, you know, right. by some combination of the two because... Bad things are going to happen. Yeah. It'll, um, yeah, it's less than ideal. Yeah, yeah. So you get your, uh, you've got your pistons, very important, whoop, very important parts of that combination, the rings. Oh, yeah, we do love a good ring. You know, they refer to this kind of as a ring pack because there's a lot going on here. So you have an upper, you have two rings to seal compression and then another two smaller, very thinner rings with a, a, as I refer to it, and I know there's a proper term, and you guys are going to hate me, what I call the squiggle ring. Um, <laughs> but those keep, you have two wiper rings as well. And that's what your kind of oil control. As the piston comes up, it's releasing oil. Then the thing comes down, and it's scraping oil off the cylinder. But this is all pressurized. And like I so said, this is going to keep, th there's a lot going on here. So, and that's another thing about pistons, is you can get into, a lot of guys are doing, we actually have some Pro LS ones, is a gas-ported piston. So when you're trying to keep as much compression in the cylinder as possible, there'll actually be a bunch of tiny holes around the outside of the surface here. Mm -hmm. And those force combustion gases down in behind the ring and keep them more tension because ring tension is important too. You know, um, if you get into kind of, uh, you know, you're building a rowdy race motor and you're shoving a bunch of nitrous in this thing and you got some backfires and crazy stuff going on, you will knock the ring tension right out of something. And then you're getting a, a bunch of excessive blow by, less compression, and um, the thing's not going to, you know, it's not going to run on kill all the time. Right. It's going to be less and less, like, and then eventually you're going to have to pull it apart, fix it, and then put it back together for your maximum performance. There's also tons of different ring profiles and designs, too, for different applications. So different ceiling surfaces, scraper. There's a crazy chart out there somewhere that shows you all the different ring profiles, and they all have a very specific job. Yep. But most of your rings are made out of a like a hard ductile iron so that's a uh, that's kind of what seals them 
Now, when putting these together, one of the important things you're going to have to do too is setting. I kind of alluded to ring changing your ring gap earlier. That's uh could be important. And there's a specific math out there, kind of on your bore size and what you want to do to how much ring gap you have. Basically, if you don't put a, enough ring gap in a motor, the thing gets to its desired temperature, gets hot, the ring grows, and then it has no. If you don't have enough ring gap, it has no more no more room to go. The ends of the ring touch, and then it busts apart mm -hmm. and costs you a lot of money. And it's not a good time. If you have too much ring gap and it's excessive, um, blow by, uh, not really a huge compression loss. You won't see like this thing's 30 points down mm -hmm. over another cylinder. But again, it's not maximum performance. You're not going to get truly what you want. It could always get better. For boosted applications, more ring gap is better. You're, um, you okay. want to be on the you want to be on the bigger side than on the smaller side because essentially you're shoving air in the motor, and then it wants to get past the ring. So you you're going to get some you know PCV. Not I shouldn't say P, you're going to get some blow by. Mm -hmm. That's going to happen in a boosted application. But you want a little more so you don't butt the rings and break the thing because you have air shoving into the motor. It's not like the thing in a conventional naturally aspirated application where the piston's coming down and drawing vacuum. You're shoving air in it and to make power. And so it just wants to shove by the ring as well and not have a good time. And yeah, you don't want to butt the rings and break it and you cry and have right. to build another motor. <laughs> right. Every piston has sort of a different number of, uh, uh, has different ring requirements. Uh, talk about the different types of pistons that there are. Oh, so there's all sorts, you know, you have forged pistons, you have hyper. Eutectic. Yes, that's how you say that fancy <laughs> word. Um, I, I forgot my pocket to Thoris today, go. guys. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you have different piston makeups, and it kind of depends what, you know, the big, you know, in the general race car application, you're going to get a forged aluminum piston. That's what you want. And that's basically where they take one block of metal mm -hmm. and they stamp it into what they want it to look like with a bunch of pressure and force. And that's really strong because you're compacting on a molecular kind of microscope level, you're compacting all the metal together and it's gonna be really, really strong versus a cast or a hypernumeric piston where you pour it and then the thing is, you know, you kind of have a bunch of cast, you know, you never know with casting yeah. what, what's gonna be weak, what's gonna be strong, it's gonna be a little inconsistent. Yeah, it's machined from that slug yeah. into, once it's, I mean, they're all machined eventually from, yeah. uh, <laughs> from the slug. Um, uh, so, and I mean, they, they have different skirt profiles, they have different, uh, sometimes they have, they have lubricants on the on Yeah, the it really depends because so you'll have like, depending if you're building a stroker application or a destroked application, your pin height can change. So like on some, you'll see a lot where the actual ring, you put it together and the ring will run over where the pin is. And it mm -hmm. all just kind of depends. That's another thing is ring location, amount of rings is important too. And it all kind of changes between application and what kind of pistons you're using. So like on a good aftermarket piston, it'll have nice thick ring lands like this one has here. Because if you have too thin of a, that's something really common to break is a ring land. You get into, you know, you're building a bunch of power and the ring, the ring land is essentially where the ring sits and lives in the piston. Well, they like to break there in high horsepower applications. So you'll come along, you know, you're shoving a bunch of power in this thing and it breaks, takes a day off and then there's pieces everywhere yeah. and it's, it's not a good time. Yeah. So yeah, there's tons of different piston designs. You know, you can even see on this, you know, we have two big, nice valve reliefs on this for, you know, you get one of them big chopping cams that they like to, you know, they have all sorts of crazy LS cam names. You know, we have truck cams and we actually, uh, we have a cam we like to call it's the, 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 the chopinator and uh, it, it's fantastic. It sounds rowdy. <laughs> so, you know, we have, you know, Torquinator and all these other, we have a Saturn, a Saturn stage five cam because the thing has all the lift and all the duration oh, and go. yeah, you know, out, Cam cam swaps is that's you know that's a whole cam design and all that's a whole another subject. But no one will take you to the moon, right? Yeah, but you want to be like so that's mindful when putting your bottom end because if I you know my piston selection is going to depend and where this thing sits. You know when I'm setting this up, is it going to sit at the deck? Is it going to sit below the deck? Uh -huh. Do I have a set of heads where the pistons are required to come slightly above the deck? It's a there's a lot. It's a big recipe, yeah. and that gets into the uh, the stroke of the the the. The stroke of the crank and the stroke of the the, the the rod. Talk about the difference between boring, stroking, you know, a stroker motor. Talk about those kinds of aspects of, of building an engine. Yeah, because there's all sorts, you know, you can build what we call a square motor, which would be your bores the same 
as your stroke, then you have under square and over square. Mm -hmm. So, you know, generally when guys de-stroke something, you're de-stroking it for big, either big boost or so you can spin the thing to the moon. But with a stroker rod, essentially you're gaining um, cubic inches by the piston is going to go far, the piston is going to travel farther. It's going to go farther down in the bore and farther up in mm -hmm. the bore. And in this, you know, when you're doing that, a eventually a stroker style piston is required and that's where they change the pin height in the piston. And when I'm talking about pin height, I'm talking about the height of the connecting rod pin between the top of the piston itself. So yeah. that varies on a bunch of pistons. And like I said, when you're building an engine, you need to, you got to pick all this stuff at once and pick an application that's going to work together. And if you're not sure, we have our really good friend Google to help us out or call into our customer service line at Summit Racing and those yeah. guys will be able to get you hooked up with whatever kind of crazy engine application you're going to build. Yeah. So like something really common to do in the days of, you know, it's not the history, but small block guy, you know, small block Chevy guys used to build, you'd get a 400 block and shove a 350 crank in it and build what they call like a 377. Mm -hmm. Or like you have a very common small block application is 383. So that's a small Chevy block, a 350, with a 400 crank in it. Really, really stellar, stellar stroker application. So yeah, essentially, you know, you can build a big, either a short rod, big bore motor, and um, like I said, just spin the snot out of the thing and mm -hmm. let it eat, or you can build a short bore, long rod motor, and you know, you're getting a different power characteristic. Now, it's always been kind of conveyed to me that the longer stroke you put in something, the better power it's going to make in kind of the bottom. It's, that's a torque, a torque application. Okay. You mentioned the, the, uh, the different small block applications. I mean, LS is just the same. You get LS motors that are in trucks, you get LS motors that are in cars, you get LS motors that are in sports cars. It's, it's been, and a lot of people think that the LS is a pretty new Pretty new engine block. It's been around 25 years. Yeah, no. Um, it's been around a long time. Yeah, you know, the first, some of the first LS cars, um, you know, that came predecessor to first generation LT. We have another LT yeah. generation now. Yeah, right. Which we loved, and there was one before that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the mid-90s, mid, mid 90s, um, you know, they went from the LT generation, which was an, uh, an aluminum-headed kind of crazy apple. Like, I remember seeing, the first time seeing an LT motor in, in an Impala SS and being like, the cavemen discovered fire. This yeah. is absolutely amazing. <laughs> But then the first time I saw an LS1, and that was like, that was in, in a Camaro or a Corvette. And it was like, this, this is cool. And really where GM hit the ball out of the park is they, in the early 2000s and, you know, the, the late 90s, having something with aluminum heads on it meant you spent all the dollars. Like aluminum, aluminum heads were the giant step into high performance. And it was kind of a unobtainium thing mm -hmm. for, for a lot of guys. Well, GM said, okay, let's party. And started shoving aluminum heads on factory stuff. And, and that was fantastic. And the factory GM heads, depending on what casting number you get, of course, but a lot of guys love the 799 or the, the 243 heads. Um, the, like the stock six liter comes with the 317 head. It's a big chamber head. Not It's great for a boosted application. But if you're building a naturally aspirated, I want to add some. Like you take uh, a stock six liter bottom end, put a decent cam in it, and a set of, you know, 243s or 799s, that thing's got like 10 and some change points of compression, and that's a runner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, all right, we've talked a lot about all the parts that go into it, at least the bottom end. We'll talk about the top end next month. We'll know more about that soon. Putting it all together. Yes. Yeah, so let's talk about that procedure, because that's something that, yeah, you can do it yourself, and but, but getting there, you, you start off by talking about the machine shop. Talk about the importance of of working with a, a, a good machinist and uh, you know what goes in to getting that block that you pulled out of the junkyard ready to uh, ready to assemble. So, you know, having a good relationship and a good reliable machinist is key and you know that's um you know machine shops have unfortunately that kind of the side of the world of engine building has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller and you know we'd love to see we you know with tomorrow's technician we need as many guys out fixing cars as we do Oops. making parts for everybody else so if you're interested in numbers and that kind of cool stuff become a machinist guys it's a really good time <laughs> yeah using really high end a lot of times really high end computer cnc equipment. oh you get to play with so much fancy stuff yeah. like yeah. i love it unobtainium yeah <laughs> so Ideally, you're going to want to get all your parts and your first shebang. So have your block, have your crank, have your rods, your pistons, your ring pack, so you know what you're building. 
So first thing first, the block needs to go to the machine shop. It needs cleaned, and then you need to check your bores. Mm -hmm. And that bore is being your cam bores, crank bores, and your cylinder bores. So make sure everything that looks crazy. These are horizontal that. and vertical. Yeah, there's any, a any hole in the engine. You want to make sure it's the exactly. right, it's so the right size. Exactly. So I recommend if the machine shop offers an option to get this thing dipped and cleaned, do it. Then you're going to want to pull. You're going to want to make sure all your oil galley plugs get pulled out. Mm -hmm. The whole thing's flushed out. You don't want any nastiness in your oil system. But then you need to talk to the machine. Well, what size? You know, what size piston are you going to use? Because piston to wall is important. It might need board and or finish honed to make sure you have a proper piston to wall mm -hmm. clearance. Because if it's not, the thing is going to warm up and it's going to cold seize, and you're going to have a bad time, and then you're going to be mad that you didn't check it. So once you know you have a good verified block, talk to your machinist, get it checked, make sure you can use standard bearings. Now, the last thing you're going to order, I will say, is going to be your bearings. Mm -hmm. Like once you have what you need, because you might have to go oversized or undersized, just kind of depending on what parts you bought. So blocks, good, cleaned, all that. Well, then you need to start talking about your pistons and rods. And there's two different kinds of balancing when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. Now, you can static balance all your stuff at home. And that's basically static balancing is taking my lightest, you know, putting my rings on my piston, taking my lightest piston and matching my other eight pistons to that lightest one. Weighing those, weighing the, the group of components yes. as, a, as, a, as a set. So you're, you're assembling your rings on the pistons yes. and weighing that, right? Yeah, your pistons and your and your piston pin itself. And the pin, okay. Yep. So you're gonna like, so you're gonna get a full set of eight pistons, assemble them with, <coughs> my bad guys. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if I wanna put that one in something now, but it'll be fine, you know, just brush the dust off. <laughs> so you're gonna put this all together with your pin and like I so say, you're gonna pick your lightest one. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to go ahead, figure out what your lightest weight is, then weigh your other seven. And you're going to come back behind here and take a little meat off behind here, kind of just very carefully, very, very gingerly are you going to be taking weight off this thing until it matches the lightest one. And you're going to do that seven times to where you have a full set that matches. And, you know, picking up a good scale is a good investment. Yeah. And, um, you know, you only spend the money once. Don't buy a bunch of junky ones. Right. Just spend a little bit of money and buy yourself something that you can have for a lifetime. Right. So once that's done, you're gonna do the same thing with your rods. And now rods can be a little different because you don't know what weight needs to come off what end. So I do recommend actually going to the machine shop and doing that. And once you become a little more familiar and you can get yourself like a rod jig and that, and that's another tool to invest in, you can take your own weight and measure your own rod. Because basically with a rod jig, you're putting, it's fixing this as a fulcrum and then you're checking the weight on the on the big end. So once you get that done and this is weighed, then that stuff is static balanced. Then mm -hmm. it's time for dynamic balancing. So dynamic balancing is weighing your piston and your rod in all in one combination, and then you're matching that to the bob. This is a counterweight on a crank, bob weight, whatever you want to call it. There's several different names. And you're going to make sure this weight with this corresponding rod essentially weighs the exact same thing. And they can either grind your crank or they add metal to it. So, and that's what adding Mallory to a crank is, um, is kind of, Mallory is a really expensive, really dense metal, mm -hmm. but it's gonna make sure this thing is harmonically happy. Because if this stuff is all, you know, you have a little bit of margin of error though, but the closer you can get it, the happier this thing is gonna be. So once everything is weighed, all that, you make sure you get the right bot bearing size, it's important, you know, just in size itself to make sure you don't need an oversized or an undersized bearing. Then you're going to start checking oil clearances, and you can do that one of two ways. So you're either going to check it with a plastic gauge, or you're going to be able to measure exactly what take a... This is what you'd use to, like, measure inside your block for your crank bore and see what that number is. And then you're going to grab your, diet, your um, micrometers, you're gonna measure the outside of your crank here and see what that is. And in these King box or any of your other bearing boxes or your engine assembly book, there's gonna be a minimal oil, oil clearance and a maximum oil clearance you need. If you're at the maximum size, then you're gonna to need to kind of do some shopping around with bearings and they make all different sizes. Like yeah. kind of one of the things we've had to do in the past and you know what I love about King, I've had really good luck is they'll buy five or six sets of bearings 
and mix and match and see what I can get to get my desired oil clearance. As I kind of alluded to earlier, if you build a motor that's a little bit on the looser side, it's going to be happy. You might not have, you know, you're not going to have 80 pounds of cold oil pressure, but the thing's going to be happy and it's going right. to live and it's going to be a good time. You build this thing too tight and parts can't grow into each other. They grow into each other and then... Um, <laughs> Cause problems. It makes nasty noises yeah. and then you're going to cry and like I said, bad time, bad time. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's just take a step back and talk about the plastic gauge that you talked about. Some people may not understand what that is. So plastic gauge is, you have a lot of uh, guys that hate on it, but it's a really, really fantastic tool. And basically it's this little paper sleeve that has a piece of plastic rope is how I would describe it. And you're gonna take this, you're gonna put your crank in, you're gonna put your bearings, and you're gonna lay this little piece of plastic on there, you're gonna put this stuff together, and you're gonna to torque this, and then you're gonna pop it back off. And then on that little paper tube that it came in, there's different color, there's, there's, it looks like a kind of almost like a little checkerboard. And each next to those checkerboard has a number next to it. Mm -hmm. And you sit there and you match that up to it. And that'll tell you what your, your clearance is. People have built motors like this for a significant amount of time. It's a great budget tool if, yeah. you know, you don't have all this crazy expensive. It takes, it takes some time to do it. Obviously, you've got to install it, torque it down, take it apart again, measure it, keep doing it. You know, and then talk about the uh, the dial bore indicators and how that works. At what you know, what you can learn from that. Yeah. So this one I actually have in front of me now is our Summit Racing brand one, and this one's cool because it goes four digits. Mm -hmm. So like this is, you know, I, when I use this, I feel like I'm Warren Johnson. Like <laughs> I'm building cool <laughs> stuff. So you have all sorts of different sized arbors that go in the end, depending on your bore size. And students, ask your instructors who Warren Johnson is if you don't know who yes. the professor is. Um, yeah, <laughs> just just like that's a party, man. Like uh, we all like said again, pro pro stock gods. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So you're gonna come inside. Basically, this is oh something we didn't talk about. This looks different than the rest of our body. This is what we call a thrust bearing. <laughs> so we didn't talk An about this one. part of the engine that we yeah. overlooked, right? So this not only has a circle. Uh, you know, I'm just. I need to put some super glue on my fingers or something, guys. But so the crank rides inside here, and then actually... Where the, on the crank does that fit? So this particular one kind of sits in the center of the engine. Okay. So a lot of them, you'll, you'll see them towards the center. So this goes in the... This is in the center, and basically what happens is the crank bumps up against it. This is what keeps it your back and forth play on your crank. Okay. Um, that's what keeps it happy. If it didn't have this, you know, it would be crank to block, again... Shavings, bad metal time, to metal. Yeah, crying. Not a good thing. So you're going to take this and you're going to measure the area where this bearing sits. And you're going to see what that number is. And it's going to give you, like I said, a really, really good readout. And when you're four digits is really precise. A lot of guys just build, to, I mean, there's guys that build two digits. Three digits is ideal. That's where sure. I like to stay. Again, I'm not building race car stuff. I try to aspire to build race car stuff, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't always work out that way. Yeah, the best plans sometimes fall apart at the uh, it, on the starting line. And, uh, it costs it costs of doing business, man. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, but yeah, you're going to use this to even in this application, you're going to use this thing to measure the inside of where this sits to see what your bearing clearance is going to be and how this thing is going to, you know, the thing everybody rants and raves about how LSs go hundreds of thousands of miles, and one of the things I've learned with building one of these over, say, your conventional small block Chevy. From the get-go, this has built a whole lot tighter than you you can build. Like, I've slapped together some small blocks, and they run fantastically, and I don't have any issues. Mm -hmm. I have I actually kind of went through a stint with truck motors not too long ago, and, you know, my bad luck. But this um, this is a lot more precise. Building the, the LS stuff is built substantially tighter than a conventional small block Chevy is, and that's just because this is modern technology. It likes tight clearances for oil, and that's what makes them last so long. Like... Our hot routers of yesteryear, a car was designed to go 50, 60,000 miles and then put a motor in it. You can go 300, a lot, there's lots of guys that drive these things to three, four, half million miles. Yeah. There's a, I know I follow a guy on YouTube that has a, you know, a Silverado that has 750,000 miles on a stock bottom end and the thing just, wow. it runs like a sewing machine. Wow. Pretty impressive. Yeah. So with measure, like I said, you're going to use tools like this to measure everything and make sure it's all happy and good. And again, if you're not comfortable or you have questions, consult your local machine shop. A lot of those guys, 
love to help and especially they like to see the younger generation getting into this so don't now if you had a bad experience or you know someone was kind of you know didn't give you the time of day try again man try right. if, if not him try somebody else there's going to be someone out there that's going to be happy to help you okay and so that's the inside inside dammers talk about uh talk a little bit again about micrometers and outside measures yeah, so when you go to measure this side, you're going to need a different tool that looks like a big, it basically looks like a giant C and has mm -hmm. different arbors you can put in for different sizes. And that kind of has a rotate function on the bottom. And one of the cool things I think people don't realize is that on a lot of them, that very bottom handle is what they call the clutch. It's a clutched handle. So you're going to go over there and you're going to turn that clutch and it's going to click and you're going to use that every time to measure so you get a consistent measurement every time versus, oh... I had a little more finger strength this time, and yeah. it ended up slightly tighter than another side. So you're going to use the micrometer to measure your actual journal. These are referred to as journals. So you have, you know, main journals and crank journals. So you're going to use that to measure the outside, and that's going to give you your number. And those two numbers are going to, diff you know, it's going to be slightly different on what it needs to be and your oil clearance is gonna be. You're gonna take the best, you're gonna put your bearings in, measure it, and then measure this, and then that's gonna tell you what, how the thin layer of oil that this all rides on, how large that's gonna be. Yeah, yeah. And again, that thin, la that thin layer of oil, that thin film of oil is really thin. Oh yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's thousands. Yeah. Hundreds yeah. of thousands. And if you, if you haven't learned how yet uh, to, to read a micrometer, and to, to learn the, the numbers, the thousands and the hundred thousands and all those different levels of, of, uh, of detail, do it because that's going to make you, that's going to help you become very proficient at, uh, yeah. at understanding. One of this. the greatest gifts I ever got was from um, when I just, I was, I don't know, I was 17. I was, you know, I was planning on becoming a tech. Like, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Someone got me what they call the machinist handbook. And it's this red bound book. Actually, if you look in like old Kennedy machinist boxes, there's a specific drawer for the thing. And there's so many iterations on top of that. Yeah. I think they're like 20. But that was, that taught me, you know, the, I still get some of these numbers confused, but that taught me the basis of what I needed. And there's so much information in there. Because if you're doing, if you're going to aspire to become a machinist and you're, or you're going to be a technician, there's so much more inside that book than just okay. numbers, metallurgy, there's it's just good information to have. So, you know, if you guys are out there looking for a little bit of literature, a machinist handbook, you know, pump that right into Google. It'll pop right up and pick yourself up. Uh, on there's it. so much we could talk about when it comes to, to roughness averages and yep. all that stuff. So we're not going to, we're not going to yeah, really finishes, get into that stuff. Yeah. Homes, yeah, crosshatch and all those things, which are fascinating and incredible and fun to talk about. But unfortunately, we don't have time to do all that today. But getting back to, uh, to the assembly process. All right. So now we've measured, we've, we've started putting it all together. Just what, bolt it up tight and run it, right? Uh, kind of, sort of, kind of, yeah, you know, just, yeah. um, ugga, you know, guys like to measure stuff in ugga uggas yeah. nowadays. <laughs> no, you're going to want to pick yourself up a good torque wrench, mm -hmm. whether it be a click style, a digital, an old bend. I still use a bend beam all the time because <laughs> you can use it as a hammer and still use it as a torque wrench. That's a joke, guys. Don't actually do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, yeah, you're going to, you know, you'll put... Your start, once you get all your desired clearances and you've measured and you're happy with what, what you think it's going to be, you're going to put your first row of bearings in. Like I said, you're going to want to use a ton of assembly lube. Make sure all this stuff is surgical clean. Like, mm -hmm. I like to wear gloves when I put stuff together. A, to keep all the oil and, you know, keep my hands nice and dainty. But, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, you know. But your fingers have oil on them, too, that is going to interfere with, uh, you know, those fingerprints. Yeah, well, that's a crazy on some of these high-performance fasteners and stuff. The finger, the oil from your fingers... Yeah can make, give them a point and weaken them to snap, which is... Same with a bearing. Well, you yeah. don't want to get finger oil on a, on a bearing. No, yeah, you want to make sure this stuff is surgical clean. So yeah. I recommend putting gloves on. So you're going to put a little assembly lube down, lay your first row of bearings down, set your crank in, and then one of the things I like to do is, you know, I'll put all this stuff together, put all my other bearings in, click them in the caps, torque it down, and then you're going to rotate. You want it, it should feel like glass. Mm -hmm. Like, if it's got a tight spot... Then you're going to want to, one of the, if I end up with a tight spot, one of the things I like to do is untorque a main cap. Check it. See if it got better or worse. Retorque that one. Move to another one yeah. and find your problem area. Yeah. Let's talk about the main caps just for a second. Uh, do you recommend when you're, when you're building using new main caps or using the ones that were on the motor when you got it maybe or 
What do you? What's your recommendation on that? So main caps are, in most applications, are married to the block. They, they are broke. You know, they are machined specifically to the block. You'll, you'll take them. You want to if you're taking a motor apart and they're not marked, before you take it apart, you're going to want to mark those and mark the orientation mm-hmm. of how it came out. So what you're going to do is you're going to get you know a good number stamp set, smack those. But in a lot of applications, you're just going to reuse your factory ones. And something high performance, like a lot of the some of the LS aluminum stuff, they actually have steel main cap conversions. You can get those machined, do that kind of deal. Now, when talking about main caps, we do want to talk about main you know our our main studs, main bolts, whatever you want to call them. If uh, you're building a high horse ap- power application, or you know you don't want to something you plan on taking apart again. It might be worth the investment of main studs. Mm-hmm. One of the drawbacks of main studs is you can't just throw these in an engine. You need to install your main studs, torque them, and then get your block what they call line honed. And that's where they take this big, long fixture that cuts. It'll actually go through the center of the block where the crank sits and machine where the crank sits. And uh, that's just a square because once you put studs in it versus a bolt, it distorts it slightly. Mm-hmm. And you want to make sure that's true or else you're going to get a tight spot. It's going to, what you know I refer to as snatch a bearing. The bearing the bearing has tangs that fix it in place. The bearing does not spin. They stay stationary. If you snatch a bearing, the bearing is moving. Bad things are happening. You're going to spin it and destroy your investment. Right. right. So once you've, you know, you've gone through, got your crank set in, got all your main bolts, main bear, you know, torqued, then you're going to start moving on to putting rods on, and mm-hmm. that's a fun. And you're going to actually assemble these outside the vehicle. So you're going to put, you know, you're going to put your pistons, you're going to put your rods on your pistons, and then put all your rings on. Then you're going to want to check. Realistically, I kind of skipped a step. You're going to want to put your rings on your pistons, and then gap all your rings. Mm-hmm. Um, that's good point. Let's talk about that. Make sure that they're, uh, you know, they're aligned correctly. Yeah. So one of the things kind of on these pistons is kind of hard for you guys to see. Um, the rings, as it's running, is rotating on a, you know, if you start off putting um, small engines together, like you're going to build your first, like you have a two-stroke dirt bike and you're going to rebuild it. A two-stroke piston actually has little nubs on the inside of your ring lands that keep the ring from rotating because transfer, that's a whole other shebang. But, you know, in building this, the ring actually rotates as this thing is running. Mm-hmm. So... You're going to go ahead and start putting your rings on your pistons. You're going to put them on. You're going to measure what the end gap of it is at fully compressed and decide if it's going to be larger or smaller. Then you're going to have to grind the ends of those to get to your desired ring gap. That, you know, your that is your spacer ring for yep. your oil controls. That's always a fun one to put on. And you don't want with a lot of rings, I've uh I don't know, I've always kind of been told and I'm not sure. You know, it goes either way. There's tons of guys that have reused rings and they're fine out there and yeah. stuff like but essentially, once you install a set of rings, and if you don't like it or that kind of deal, you don't want to pull them back out and put them in because at on a microscopic level, you pull it back out of the bore, the ring does a kind of a spring action, yeah. and then it cracks it to where you can see it under a microscope. Science stuff. I yeah. don't know if it's yeah. true, but yeah. you know we'll see. So, but yeah, you're going to assemble these in a certain way, and each different ring set is going to come with instructions. Like there's a lot of companies that put a dot on the upside. And then that's how you're going to put them on. So you're going to want to be mindful of the instructions, and because the ring works one way, if you flip it over, it's not going to it's right. not going to seal compression. You're going to get a bunch of bunch of bad stuff yep. going on. So and you want to build them from uh, bottom to top. So put on your wiper ring and your spacer ring first, then your second ring, then your first ring. Repeat that step seven more times, and then you're ready to party. Yeah. And they're going to come separately. They're going to come, you know, in a in a uh, in a bag, uh, separately uh, indicated which ring is which, so you don't have to guess. Certainly don't want to guess. Yeah, no, you don't (laughs) want to be putting the wrong rings in the wrong locations. Yeah, even though they kind of look similar. They all do something different. Yeah, they're all different, right. All right, so we've got the rings on the pistons. We're putting the, uh, putting the, 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 uh, the rods on the pistons. How's this fit over the crank, man? Oh, it's just crazy, crazy. Now, this is a fun one. Oh, these ones are actually tight, and you know okay. I can't spin it. So there's two different there's two different styles. You have ones that you have to break yourself, which is kind of similar to what this deal is. Is you'll take these bolts out and you'll give this thing a nice little smack, and then 
they crack and they break, and then that's your sealing surface, or there's machine surfaces. So it kind of just depends what kind of rod you have. A more budget rod is going to be is going to be a brake cap style rod, mm -hmm. and you can't mix these up. These are married to each other. So if this one comes from this one, it, you need to indicate and make sure you have it. They has location. to go the same side on the same rod. You can't you can't mix those up. Yeah, no bad times, bad yeah, times. Yeah. So yeah, so this cap itself comes off with these nice two little bolts. You're going to put your bearing in again, lube the back slide it in and um, you'll see companies make cool little rubber caps if you have a studded rod versus this is a bolt you know this is a bolted rod so you'll have kind of two studs hanging out the end you'll put some nice little rubber caps wrap them in blue painters tape just depending work with what you have you mm -hmm. don't have to spend all the dollars spend it where it counts mm -hmm. um, and then you're going to slide this whole you're also going to want to get a good um, ring compressor so i started off and used for a long time the, um, we've all seen that Lyle style where it's got the kind of the, the uh, square key and you torque it down. Um, Summit makes one. ARP makes a really cool kind of size specific to your pistons. So if you're going to be building a bunch of LS motors, get one that's specific for your bore. Like, you know, small block Chevy is um, one of the pistons, a four inch piston. It's uh, 101 millimeters, 0.4. And basically these ring compressors have a slight taper built into them. So you'll come over to your cylinder, insert your rod and piston. That's got a taper, compresses a ring, and the thing slides in. And they even have cool piston installation hammers that have a real long side. There's all sorts of cool stuff right. for engine building right. out there. Like I said, flip open that summit. Uh, the, we have a tool catalog. <laughs> There's all sorts of cool engine building stuff in there that everybody should put in their toolbox. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we've 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 we're and we're doing this in the block now. These, yes. These, we're now we're working inside the block. Yeah. So uh, I kind of mentioned it earlier that there's a bevel side of the rod and a flat side of the rod. Um, you're going to want to make sure your flat sides are up against each other, so rod orientation is important. Mm -hmm. So you're going to slide these things in, slide them in the bore, then put your other bearing in your rod cap, put this thing together, torque it, and then do that. One of the things I like to do that I was taught is I install one rod, rotate the thing once. Install another rod, rotate it once. Because if you do have a tight one or you have something going on, that allows you to identify it was, oh, it was this last one that I put on. Mm. It was smooth until, yeah, boom. So once you get all those done, you know, your eight out of eight, your rods are installed, then it's time to put start putting some other parts on. And uh, the other parts are important. In an LS application, it's going to be your timing, your timing set, your oil pump, your oil pickup, your oil pan. And then, you know, then it's time to put a top end on and you're almost ready to park. Yeah, it. yeah. Um, all right, so we uh, we've talked about a lot of the components. Let's touch base again on the the difference between the the, the bolts and the studs and the importance of quality and uh, not just tighten them up until they feel tight. Yeah, so with a lot of this, it is a sequence. So you know you're going to go uh, this ARP stuff usually goes in sequences of three when you're torquing it. So you have an initial like 22 pounds, and you're going to go a little higher than you go. And some of like the factory GM stuff, you actually build like with a torque to yield fastener. You either need a degree wheel or a really fancy torque wrench with mm -hmm. a degree option to be able to you know it's torque it to 22 foot pounds, then take it 90 degrees, and then do something else 90 more degrees. So it really with good quality hardware it allows you to a reuse it several times but this is going to hold more power you don't want a rod bolt fail a generally speaking a rod you know in my past experiences a rod bolt will fail or a will fail before a lot of other things fail because this is going up and down and trying to rip itself apart this entire time talk about the uh the the use of lubricants on on fasteners. Yeah, no. So especially with the ARP deal is they have their own specific, they call it ultra torque lube when you're putting this together. You don't want to torque and install bolts dry because you're going to get a false reading because of all the friction. Mm -hmm. So when you use, you know, installing ARP, you're going to want to use fastener assembly lubricant only when installing this kind of stuff. If you put that assembly lube on your um, factory bolts and stuff like that, you're just going to want to use a little bit of old motor oil on those. The ARP lube will allow it to work so good, you'll just be like, oh, this isn't getting tighter. This isn't getting tight. Tink! Yeah. And then there goes the head off the yeah. bolt, unfortunately. Yeah. That can be a problem before you even get out onto the, out onto the track. 
Right? Yes, so yes. You know, you way. don't breaking a motor, building it is never a good time. Like uh, <laughs> it's not fun. I I don't recommend it. Right, right. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we we touched briefly on uh, oil pickups and oil pans. Let's let's kind of close up the bottom end and uh, okay, yeah. talk about that. Yeah, so once you get your crank installed and all that, you know, you're going to install your lower. In an LS, it's lower timing gear first. And, you know, you haven't put your cam in yet, so you just have to put that on. Um, you're going to want to then hang your timing chain mm -hmm. on it because once the oil pump's on, you can't really get it on. <laughs> so... You're going to hang your timing chain, and it's really easy to build one of these upside down like this. This is how, kind of how I prefer to mm -hmm. do it. Because, um, you know, I couldn't imagine, like, trying to hold the crank in and do it from the bottom. You know, a great, a good engine stand is indispensable. I've seen dudes do it on a tire, too. Just work with what you got. Yeah, yeah right, right. <laughs> and the heads aren't on, so you're, working, yeah. you're able to work with the cylinder bores. <laughs> yes, yes. So... You're going to go ahead, put your lower timing gear on, hang your timing chain on the thing, and then you're going to install your oil pump. So once your oil pump's on, and one of the things I also like to do is I like to take, um, they have that kind of that white lithium grease uh, ex uh, assembly lube. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a white tube with a blue cap. We've all seen it. It's got a picture of a couple different engine pieces on the front of it. But I like to fill my oil pump up with that. So when I, the, my first startup in that, it allows it, it doesn't allow it to run dry. The thing, it'll build pressure. It, it allows it to build vacuum to pull mm -hmm. oil to where mm -hmm. you need it to go. And then all that stuff will disappear with your first initial oil change. So you're going to go ahead and install your oil pump. Also make sure you use, you know, I like to use a fresh oil pump every time, fresh gaskets, all that. You don't want to reuse that stuff and risk it. You're going to put your pump on, and then your pickup's going to go on. Well, I shouldn't say that. On an LS, your windage tray is going to go on first. and we kind Explain of, what that is. So a windage tray is a steel tray that goes kind of on the bottom here between your oil pump and between where your oil is sitting that your pickup's picking up. And windage is basically what happens. The oil gets is flowing around and it's foaming and it's doing all sorts of because that crank is in there spinning aggressively. So that windage tray puts a barrier between the crank and the oil in the bottom end to keep it from foaming and you know getting flung around and keeps it. it's about all about oil control and keeping it in the pan so the pickup can take it to lubricate the motor so your windage tray is going to go on and depending on what oil pan or you know ls you're building a you know the 4.8 and 5.3 use the same windage tray um six liter like the stroker motor there's a different tray that's you know, there's guys that bend them and do all sorts of mm -hmm. they make a bunch of different aftermarket trays that are really affordable for your application so then you're going to bolt your windage tray on, and that's going to hold on these, actually the outsides of these studs here. Um, and then on top of that, your oil pump pickup's going to go on. Make sure that thing is good and fastened. And one of the things on the LS a lot of guys like to do is the oil pickup from the factory is only held on by one bolt. A lot of these new pickups and aftermarkets, um, great companies like Summit and I, even ICT Billet sells one, is a little two, it's a... It adds a second bolt to the oil pump pickup, mm. so you don't have to worry about it falling off. Yeah. Because that is a thing that happens with this LS stuff. Um, so you're going to put that on, and then your pan, you know, we talked about tons of different pans. Whether you're using a truck pan, an F-body, there's all sorts of different things. And actually, Different one, types of racing. Yes. <laughs> Whether you're going in a, a you know, yeah. you're doing just an oval track. High capacity pans, yeah. um, different baffles. It just yeah. depends on your application. So be kind of mindful when selecting. Actually, one of the things I forgot to talk about, and all this LS stuff is all, you know, four is, is six bolt mains. You're building a small box Chevy, they have two bolts and four bolts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they really came up. And what I mean by that is your main cap has two bolts here, two more here, and then two that come in from the sides to make this thing really strong. Because this crank is trying to escape the entire time. Yeah. It just wants to come out. So, you know, you, you want, it, it's all six bolt. It's all great, fantastic stuff. So, well, I shouldn't say it's all six bolt. Most of it's six bolt. Yeah. A lot of it's four bolt, six bolts, kind of the aftermarket option. But yeah, once you get your oil pan on, your bottom end's sealed up, and it's time to start putting top end parts on. Yeah. So, and at that point, you can put your back and front covers on. Like there's, you know, slide your cam in, put your covers on, and then heads, rocker assemblies, and you're ready to go racing. Yeah. And just as a reminder, on uh, November 16th, we will be talking about the top end. Yeah, and you know, top end parts is a lot, that's a lot of fun because yeah. that that's where all the parties like the party happens. There's so many different cylinder heads, cylinder head. The, the airflow theory is crazy. It's, I know, I like, I like top end stuff because that's, that's what decides really how high this thing's going to rev and how much power it's going to make. This, this stuff here is the business part of the engine. 
the top end is the party end. It is. Yes, so yes. it's like a mullet. It's, it, it, it's it is mullet a mullet in the car, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, how can our our viewers get more information about all this stuff? So. All this stuff is available on summitracing.com. So head over to the Summit Racing website or one of our four retail locations. Or if you have questions, call into our customer service line and the folks over there will be able to hook you up with the information and tech that you need to build yourself one gangster LS bottom end. For Justin and all the gang at Summit Racing, I'm Doug Kaufman with Tomorrow's Technician. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back here again on uh, November 16th for yep. the top end. Yep, thanks for having me, Doug. It's always been a pleasure. And you guys, the golden question always is, what are you working on? Keep up the good work, everybody.